Hi, I'm Adrian Goins, the Director of Community and Evangelism for Rancher Labs. Some of you might know me from my YouTube channel, or you might have run into me at KubeCon or one of Rancher's meetups or online trainings. I'm grateful to be here with you, especially in these bizarre and difficult times, and I hope that what I share with you today helps you with the decisions that you'll face in the future. If you don't already know me, you'll find out pretty quickly that I'm upfront and direct. In fact, let's just leave it at that and dive right in. Kubernetes, it's a pain to use. This keeps people away from it. By a show of hands, how many of you were excited when you first decided to learn Kubernetes? Exactly, I see zero people with their hands up. Kubernetes tools are also a pain to use. A system which is modular requires modules, but when every module is its own complex system, the pain compounds. Kubernetes is flexible, but it really needs booster packs to deliver on its promises. How do you begin to choose from a landscape like this? You're signing up for something without knowing the full consequences, and that's scary. My goal for today is to help you apply DevOps principles to decisions about Kubernetes and its ecosystem of tools. You're all DevOps people. DevOps was created because devs were tired of ops getting in the way, being bureaucratic, holding sway over needed infrastructure, and generally just slowing down the process of getting things done. Devs created tools to do what ops wouldn't, and in doing so, they told ops that they weren't needed. Ops said that devs were irresponsible. Devs said that ops were onerous. Someone fired a Nerf gun over a cubicle wall, and the great cloud wars began. But I bet you all love containers. As developers, you've all experienced the problem of, well, the app runs fine on my computer, when shipping code. Containers solve that, but in doing so, they just create more problems. Now, problems by themselves aren't bad. In fact, we never get rid of our problems. We just trade them in for new ones. The name of the game is to develop a world where you have the best set of problems you can effectively manage. Who do you think created Kubernetes? Was it developers looking for ways to complicate their lives? Or was it a bunch of operators looking for ways to manage the deployment of applications at massive scale? It was most definitely the ops camp looking for a way to automate not only the deployment of applications, but also the recovery of failed applications and the coordinating of rogue nodes so that the whole of the application ecosystem continued to function. Nodes and apps are ants in the colony. When one of them goes south, the first step in remediation is to just destroy it and create a new one. Kubernetes makes that easy, but only once you've gone through the hurdles of getting it up and running in the first place. See, Kubernetes almost seems like the ops folks lashed back, saying to devs that, here's a tool we all have to use to run containers and you have to use it too, and if you think that you don't need operators, well, have fun spending the next year or more figuring all this out. And that's how it's presented. There's the all-powerful King Kubernetes, and you're his slave. He sits in his high castle, and every interaction with him is a slog up a muddy hill, in the rain, uphill, both ways, when it's nearly freezing out. But it doesn't have to be that way. Let's first look at what DevOps is all about. No one knows, right? I mean, it's great that there's a picture that shows the Mobius wave of process, but to this day, if you ask five people what DevOps is, you'll get at least seven answers. Regardless of the specifics, DevOps is about creating processes that automate things that a human would otherwise have to do, because remember, we're being honest here, Humans are terrible at doing the same thing over and over and over again. It, it doesn't matter what it is. We're either screwing around with it and calling it optimization, or we're just doing it differently because, well, because we can. And when you apply that to systems that like consistency, you end up with drift. You go from having a bunch of nodes and apps working in harmony to a cacophonic symphony of five-year-olds bashing on a piano. And there's also the bus test. How many of you hold sacred knowledge in your head that only you know? If something were to happen, like the proverbial getting hit by the bus, how many of the systems that you're responsible for are documented well enough that someone else could pick up the work and keep them going? Since you're DevOps people, if you were to all raise your hands, I'm guessing the number would be higher than average, but still nowhere near 100%. Automation is good. Like, really good. 
I learned a long time ago that if I can't be replaced, I can't be promoted. And if you're the grand poobah of app deployment or system wrangling, then the only way that you can clone yourself is to automate what you do. So you've got a thing that you do, and you believe in automation. You automate the thing with tools that do it for you, and now you're writing instructions that tell a system what to do. Like a good system, it does it the same way every time, and you hopefully get the same result. Or if you don't, it errors out and just says, uh-uh, and leaves you to go figure it out, because you are, after all, the creator. Why do you do these things? Look at the processes that you've created. Every one of them could be done a different way. Some could even be done manually, yet you chose automation. You built the instructions for an engine. Besides the actual thing that came out the other end of the machine, what was the result? Consistency, repeatable actions, velocity, and more free time to do something else. Ultimately, DevOps gets you from wherever you are to wherever you want to be faster than if you just did it yourself. Everything you use is a tool. A tool has a cost to use it. That cost is measured in currency, in energy, and in lost opportunity. Here's a hammer. Let's say it costs $25. It drives nails into wood. It uses the energy of my muscles to do this. It also creates impact stress, and after some period of time, my muscles and joints feel pain. When they're sore, I have to stop using the hammer and rest. During that time, I can't drive more nails. This is a nail gun. It costs about $400. It also drives nails into wood, but it uses an air compressor to power it. It's faster, and I can drive a lot more nails in the same amount of time. The nails cost more, and the compressor uses electricity. Both of those represent money that's no longer available for me to spend on something else. This is a rock. It costs nothing. It also drives nails into wood, but not as well as a hammer. Sometimes it slips and the nail bends and sometimes my hand gets cut by the nail. And when that happens, I have to take a break and I can't drive any more nails until it heals. If the goal is to drive a single nail into a piece of wood once every six months, then the cheapest tool will get the job done just fine. If the goal is to frame a house, I probably don't want to use the rock. No, the other rock. And this all makes sense, right? You use this logic every day. You can separate the value of a tool from its currency cost by asking yourself if you would still use it if it was free. The criteria that inform that decision are the criteria on which you should compare all tools. The other companies that are here today have tools that you can use to do things faster. I personally know people who work at two of them. Instana has a bunch of tools, but let's just look at one of them. It can do distributed tracing with no changes to your code. Why is that appealing? Because you want a tool that's a force multiplier, not a tool that says it can do something if you first go in and spend hours updating your code. What right does a company have to force you to do more work just so that you can use their solution? You're not going to do that, and Instana knows that. So they created a solution that delivers the same value at a much lower cost. JFrog also has different tools. One is a combined registry for container images and Helm charts. Why is that appealing? Because the alternative is to run two pieces of software, one for your container images and another for your Helm charts. That takes more resources to manage, and that's more things that can break. They also have an image scanning component that integrates with their artifact repository. Why would you want that? Because the alternative is to pull images down, scan them with a solution like Claire, and then upload them to Artifactory. More steps, more things to break, more headache, more pain, and when faced with a solution that generates pain, people will choose to do nothing at all, even if doing nothing at all has other consequences. In most cases, things that cause pain are bad, and you should definitely get them out of your life. But what if the pain is just, I don't want to do this because it's more work? When presented with that problem structure, the key to removing the pain has two forms. One is to counter the I don't want to do this with I'm not going to do this. That's the easy way out. That's why we don't exercise as much as we should or eat properly or trade any of our bad habits for good ones. The other form is to attack the second half of the problem statement. If you don't want to do it because it's more work, what if it was less work? Would you want to do it then? The solutions from JFrog and Instana are both good solutions because you can do more with less and get back a block of time and energy that you can spend on something else. The model is the same, acceleration, velocity. It's not exactly automation, but it parallels it by giving you a drop-in solution for a problem so that you don't have to build it and manage it yourself. 
Interestingly, if you took a physics class, you might remember that both acceleration and velocity are vectors. They have a magnitude and a direction. So for them to exist means you're going somewhere. A little nerd trivia. What does any of this have to do with Kubernetes? The only reason that people don't want to use Kubernetes is because it's too much work. It's too complicated. You have to learn too many things too quickly. If this is what you believe, then you're right. But whatever you believe is right, because it's what you believe. Your mind creates a world that supports your beliefs. So if instead you believe that Kubernetes is easy or that learning how to use Kubernetes will give you a beautiful world where all of your dreams come true, then you're also right. Given the two options, I choose to believe the one that makes my world better and easier to manage. But in order for that to work, I have to change the problem statement to, I want to use Kubernetes because it will directly improve my life. That's the choice that I made three years ago. Before then, I hated Kubernetes. Hated, 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 hated. I saw it as a thing where I had to spend more time to get something done than if I used a different solution. And at the time, the different solution was Rancher's Cattle Orchestrator. Now, I think of Kubernetes as the perfect little helper. It never eats, never sleeps, never does anything other than what I tell it to do, and it will continue to do those things until it's dying breath. I run a Kubernetes cluster in my house. I run another one out in DigitalOcean. I spin them up and down every week for training that I do on Kubernetes and Rancher. I can do this because I found ways to make Kubernetes less work and thereby to make it more valuable and less painful. I intentionally don't want this to be a talk about why you need Kubernetes because I've already established that you don't. The only things that you truly need are shelter, water, fire, and food in that order. What I want this to show you is that Kubernetes is an appealing option if you can get it from this sucks to this is actually useful in the shortest time possible. Here's Rancher's model for success with Kubernetes, built from our experience powering Kubernetes clusters in businesses and governments all over the world. It starts at the bottom with certified Kubernetes distributions. We have two of them, RKE, which runs entirely in Docker containers, and K3S, which is a super lightweight Kubernetes distro that runs equally well in data center and resource-constrained environments. Above that, you need a management layer that gives you consistent cluster operations, security policy and user management, and shared tools and services. These things are huge time sinks when you do them manually, so a solution at this layer needs to take a significant portion of that weight off of you by automating and centralizing the work. Finally, you have your applications, and as long as they're built on a solution that fills in the two layers beneath them, then they'll be in the best position to run successfully. Rancher has solutions that fit these layers, but don't just take my word for it. You can use any solution that meets the criteria and you'll be successful. Kubernetes is like a commodity. It's like electricity. It matters less where it comes from and more that it's there when you turn on the switch. So if the end result is the same, then the deciding factor comes back to the cost for receiving the service more than the actual service itself. Do you want to just turn the light on? Or do you want to pedal a bicycle to generate power that you can store in a battery? Do you want solar panels or a coal plant? In both of these options, you still get electricity, but what's the cost? Personally, I don't think that our competitors are doing anything wrong. They're just doing things differently with a different objective and a different cost. The same is true of any other solution that you choose for Kubernetes. The measure of success is how well any of them help you meet your goals. What's the cost in currency, energy, and lost opportunity? There are a billion resources online that show you how to plug Kubernetes into automation workflows to bridge the last mile between code and deployment. There are a billion other resources that talk about how Kubernetes will babysit your applications for you and keep them running. But what I like about Kubernetes is that it operates off of two states, the actual state and the desired state. It uses a declarative syntax to define what it should be doing. Declarative means not open to interpretation. So you tell Kubernetes your desired state, and it does whatever it needs to do to move from the actual state to the desired state, and then hold it there for as long as it has the resources to do so. See what I mean? It's a perfect little helper. It's not going to try and optimize things because it's bored. It's just going to do what you told it to do every single time. Does that sound anything like our objectives for automating processes with DevOps? Maybe if we approach Kubernetes as a tool that makes our lives easier instead of a tyrant that's out to kill us, we can use it to be more successful. The value of Kubernetes has been proven, although it's not a fit for every situation. 
you probably don't need Kubernetes for your blog. But if you're building anything where there's a container that needs to be deployed and made available to the world and then managed so that if it dies, it gets restarted, Kubernetes is a great solution. How do you get there? Let's start with deploying Kubernetes. We want a solution that gets us to our destination fastest and with the least amount of pain. I've already established the criteria for success, but let's quickly run through a few options. Kubespray. It uses Ansible to build a single cluster. The playbooks are complicated, and one of the drawbacks of Ansible is that if something fails in the middle, you can't really restart from that point. You have to make a change, and now you're not guaranteed to have an idempotent state if you go again. You're better off blowing away those nodes and starting over, which makes it an expensive, time-consuming solution. You also have to know Ansible, which ultimately makes it less portable. Cops, or Kops, has its own syntax for building clusters, and it only works in a small number of locations. That's great if you're in one of those locations and you never plan to move, but you don't know what your future holds. Don't build your house with proprietary screws that require a special tool, because if the vendor decides tomorrow that those screws or that tool costs $1,000 each, well, you're stuck. KubeADM. This is where many people start, but it's manual. It's not the most manual, but it requires manual configuration of host dependencies before you can manually wire the hosts together into a cluster. Manual configuration fails the automation test. There are paid solutions from companies like Red Hat and VMware. There are SaaS solutions too, like Platform 9 and Kubler. When someone takes something that's free and they sell it to you, they know that they're competing not with other commercial entities, but with you doing it yourself. So therefore, they're going to deliver it in a way that restricts your movement, either through proprietary extensions that you become dependent on, or through bundling it with other proprietary software so that your options are either to use their products, which are expensive, or settle for a bad alternative. For example, there's one vendor whose Kubernetes only comes with two choices for networking, their expensive paid solution or Flannel, which has no security at all. So they're literally giving you a choice between no security and expensive security. But that's not really a choice because there are other CNI drivers for Kubernetes that are free and secure. They just don't let you use them. You could pay for a cloud provider for a hosted Kubernetes solution. They manage the control plane and you just deploy workloads. But if anything goes wrong with the control plane, unless you're paying them for support, you're on your own. This is different from running your own cluster without support, because at least in your own cluster, you can interact with the control plane. In a hosted solution, you can't. And if the provider takes 24 hours to answer your support requests, how much did that cost you? Rancher has two Kubernetes solutions. RKE runs entirely in Docker containers. You create a declarative configuration file and you run RKE up to apply it to the hosts. It does this over SSH. Because the only dependency is Docker, it makes hosts easy to provision with Ansible, Terraform, Puppet, Chef, CloudInit, or whatever else you're using. Because the configuration is declarative, you can hold it in a repo and anyone can use it to get the same results. RKE can build single clusters or multi-node clusters in less than 10 minutes. K3S is a super lightweight version of Kubernetes that runs all of the Kubernetes components in 512 megabytes of RAM or less. It requires nothing on the host, and it takes less than a minute to create a cluster. There's a tool to install it over SSH, or you can fire up hosts with the process already running. You can build single node or multi-node clusters, and it has unique options for high availability that cost less than etcd. You can even run a multi-node K3S cluster locally in Docker for development and test your apps in real HA Kubernetes with the same distribution that you're running in production. At the end of each of these, you have Kubernetes. I'm not here to tell you which solution to use. I'm here to empower you to think critically about the value of the options in front of you and then turn you loose to create the world that you desire. Let's look at this again. You're trying to get to the top layer where you have apps deployed. There's a huge chasm between the bottom layer where you've deployed Kubernetes and the top layer where you're using it. You need a friend here, something that does the heavy lifting for defining the workloads and deploying them. Rancher is community focused and open source, and it's the most widely adopted solution with over 100 million downloads. It provides simple, consistent, multi-cluster operations, including cluster provisioning and upgrades, version management, visibility and diagnostics, monitoring and alerting, and centralized audit. It enables process automation for security policy and user management with global configuration for all of your clusters, no matter where they're running. 
It provides a rich ecosystem catalog of services for building, deploying, and scaling containerized applications, including app packaging, CICD, logging, monitoring, and service mesh. It lets you have your cake and eat it too, if you just decide what you want your cake to taste like. The best part is that everything from Rancher is free to use. Free. Open source. You'll have it up and running in a minute. You can immediately deploy new clusters or you can import your existing ones and start putting Kubernetes to work for you right now. I live in a world where Kubernetes works for me, not the other way around. It's not that far away from the world that you're in now. In my world, I spin clusters up in minutes, not hours. I have a management layer that enforces consistency. It's a world with tools that can shorten the distance between where you are and where you want to be by light years. Don't accept complexity for complexity's sake. When someone hands you a solution, look at it and figure out if it fits your requirements, your model for success, and if it works to get you to where you want to go. If it does, well, then use it. But if it doesn't, then don't. You're in control. All of this, this is your world. I'll be here for Q&A after the session, and I look forward to meeting you and answering any questions that you have about Rancher or Kubernetes. I'm joined today by Kyle Rome, Rancher's Director of Field Engineering for the Americas, and Jason Skshipek, one of Rancher's field engineers. Both of them will be available all day for questions, demos, and to help you with the next steps. If you can't wait to get started, head over to rancher.com slash quickstart, and you'll be up and running in two steps. If you want a deeper dive, you can find documentation at rancher.com slash docs, and just this week, we launched the Rancher Academy at academy.rancher.com. There, you can get in-depth training on Rancher that ends with an official Rancher certification. And like everything else that we do, it's free for you. Thank you so much for spending this time with me today. I wish all of you absolute success in all of your endeavors.